So in my research group, uh, we are interested in the electronic properties of solids. So this is, for example, magnetism, uh, superconductivity. And generically, what we're trying to do is to understand how the microscopic behavior of electrons gives rise to a macroscopic behavior, which we can then observe in a solid. So in a magnet, uh, what we have is that the individual electrons, they are kind of sitting on, the, on a certain lattice and they have this uh, tiny magnetic moments. So they are kind of elementary magnets, which we physicists call the spin. And in one of those, what is called a ferromagnet, all the spins want to align in the same direction. This then finally gives rise to a large magnetic moment since all the tiny elementary spins sum up and give a large magnetic field. So while these uh, kind of ferromagnets are very well known, there's also other patterns in which uh, the elementary magnets, the spins can align. And this is what is shown here. We see there are the blue arrows, which kind of all point up and the red arrows, which all point down. So two neighboring spins, they align in the opposite direction. And this is what is called an anti ferromagnet. This is a very interesting pattern, but it does not give rise to a macroscopic uh, magnetic field. However, there's other reasons why we are interested in this. And one of them is that we can, for example, remove a couple of electrons and then we see those electrons are free to hop on the lattice again. And this can give rise to rather intriguing physics. For example, this can be an explanation why superconductivity happens. Superconductivity is a phenomenon which occurs when electrons pair up in so-called Cooper pairs, which allows lossless uh, conductivity and conductivity without resistivity, as well as the uh, repulsion of magnetic fields. Now, typically, two electrons repel each other through the uh, Coulomb interaction, but in certain uh, cases, uh, we can have uh, attractive interactions which allow them to pair up. In some materials, this mechanism is well understood, how this attractive force occurs. Uh, but in so-called unconventional superconductors, this mechanism is much less understood. And in particular, uh, in superconductors, uh, which occur at higher temperature than uh, low temperature superconductors. Temperature can, in a sense, be viewed as disorder or something which causes disorder. And so if we have these two electrons in a Cooper pair, a high temperature will or can split these electrons up, which makes them no longer superconducting. A class of materials which is known to show unconventional uh, superconductivity at high temperatures uh, are the so-called uh, cuprates, which look something like this, where we have layers of copper and oxygen which barely interact with other layers. So we can essentially model them as uh, 2D systems on a square lattice like this. So the interesting physics about these materials is when we actually study the layers of them, where there are the copper and oxygen atoms, and ask the question what happens to these electrons within these layers. So we can think about an electron on each side, and when there's exactly one electron per site, they like to form this antiferromagnetic pattern, this ABAB, up, down, up, down. And due to the electron-electron interactions, they can't actually hop on top of each other. So they become locked like this, and they're actually insulating. The materials become even more interesting once we ask the question of what happens when we remove a few of these electrons. So I could do this by just taking these two out. Um, and now the electrons are actually able to hop into the empty sites. The issue is, though, these electrons that now want to hop together um, lose this nice antiferromagnetic pattern that they had. And we can sort this out in the material if all of the electrons on one side all flip together. So now they keep their nice antiferromagnetic alignment. And now at the boundary, we're also still happy and they're free to hop around. And when we take lots and lots of electrons away from these layers and these cuprate materials, one thing that can happen is that these lines where the holes all form up and we have these boundaries in this antiferromagnetic pattern happens periodically throughout the layer, forming what are called stripes in the materials. More generically, if we just consider where the electrons are in the system and forget about their spins for a second, uh, they can actually clump together in a periodic fashion. So we can have regions where the electrons are and then regions where there's no electrons or what we like to call holes. And 
These form like a whole periodic density wave. And this is what we call a charge density wave. But when this charge density wave is coupled with the antiferromagnetic pattern in the stripes that we just talked about, um, then this is a phase called the stripe phase. So dealing with the physics of atoms and electrons, uh, we are using a mathematical theory called quantum mechanics. And the key object in quantum mechanics, which describes what the electrons do, is the so-called wave function. So let us see what it takes to actually represent a wave function, the state of an electron or multiple electrons. So if we have, for example, one electron, we can say that this electron's magnetic moment, its spin can either point up or it can point down. So we can write down the probability of the electron pointing up or the uh, probability of the electron pointing down. So those are two numbers we actually need to store. But now if we have two electrons, we see there can be four different configurations. The electrons can either point both up, up down, down up, or down down. And to specify the state of these two electrons, we are then need four numbers. And as you see, this grows very quickly. By the time we are at uh, 50 electrons, we have to store 2 to the power of 50 numbers. So this is exponential growth. And this seems like a very daunting task. However, we live in very uh, fortunate times that now, in modern times, there exist cool new uh, computer algorithms which can actually deal with such beasts. So typically, tensor network algorithms work like this. Uh, we don't keep track of all the information in the system, but we only keep track of the important components of it, and we lose the rest of the information. So the way it goes about is typically what happens in image compression as well. When we compress the raw data image to .jpg files without losing much of what the picture tries to convey. Turns out, in quantum mechanics, we can do the same. When we are trying to express different phases of matter. Uh, we don't have to store all the information in this high rank tensor, but we can only keep very few components and to an appreciable degree, we can still represent those phases. So a scalar in tensor network diagrams can be just written as a circle, okay? To denote a vector, we just have a circle with a leg sticking out of it. And similarly for a matrix, we have two legs sticking out of a circle and similarly for rank 3 tensors, we have 3 legs. And when we deal with realistic systems, we deal with high rank tensors. And in that case, we will have one circle with many legs sticking out of it. At this moment, this high dimensional tensor has all the information in it. But what tensor network algorithms do is it attempts to represent this tensor using small number of tensors and the information is compressed while we are representing this huge tensor as uh, small, uh, small dimensional tensors broken up into different components and we can easily manipulate these components and compress them. So basically we are uh, trying to understand what possible forms of ordering that could happen at low temperatures in the stoped antiferromagnets. And we've seen the stripes, uh, so one of our contributions was to actually see how the stripes uh, develop if you cool down the systems to low temperatures. So we can actually give an estimate at what temperatures we expect stripes to form and how exactly this happens. So we've seen a uh, stripe is the coexistence of a charge density wave with an antiferromagnet. But now one could also ask the question, can there be a coexistence of a charge density wave with a superconductor? And so now there's increasing evidence for this. And in one of our recent studies, we also find that this coexistence can happen. But not only this, we find that there's a very peculiar effect that can take place. So as I was explaining previously, uh, in a superconductor, the electrons form Cooper pairs and those Cooper pairs form one synchronized dance. But now what happens uh, when we have a coexistence of a charge density wave with a superconductor is that there are certain groups of electrons which perform a different dance. So a certain uh, number of electrons performs one dance and a certain number of electrons performs a different dance. This is a new effect and this is called a fragmentation of a condensate. So a fragmentation between the electrons doing one dance and another.
So generically, every new form of order is very important. We see uh, magnets are used in a variety of technologies. Metals are used in a variety of technologies. And here we are proposing completely new states of matter, which we hope will be found uh, in experiments and actual materials. And then in the big future will also lead to new technologies.